Hey man, so you did mention it a couple times in your video, um, but you also titled your video uh, Perdurance, Relativity and Other Time Related Concepts, and I'd never heard of Perdurance before, so I went to uh, Wikipedia, and um, this is very interesting, and uh, after reading it, which I'll, I'll read a couple parts of it in a second, I was sure that um, Alfred North Whitehead was some variety of a perdurantist. Um, and sure enough, at the bottom, he was listed as um, a notable perdurantist, uh, as was Quine and nobody else I've really heard of. Um, so, perdurantism, and I'm reading from the Wikipedia page now, or perdurance theory, is a philosophical theory pers of persistence and identity. So it's a philosophical theory um, that's supposed to account for um, the existence of identities, of objects which maintain uh, a certain form over time. Um, the perdurantist view is often defined as being the claim that objects have distinct temporal parts as opposed to endurantism, which is the view that an individual is wholly present at every moment of existence. Um, so, right, uh, we sometimes think of time as a series of discrete instants, um, which is called endurantism, um, such that the identity of any object in particular will, will be fully present in any one of those given instants. Um, Perdurantists disagree. They think it requires a certain um, amount of time for anything to be fully present. And I think this becomes especially ob obvious in the case of organisms, who, um, because organic form is essentially a process rather than a substance or some fixed state, you can't identify the identity of an organism without taking um, a temporal duration into consideration. In other words, you can't understand what an organism is by taking a snapshot in time of its physical parts as they stand in an instant. So, let's continue reading. The use of indoor and perdor to distinguish two ways in which an object can be thought to persist can be traced to David Kellogg Lewis. However, contemporary debate has demonstrated the difficulties in defining perdurantism and also endurantism. For instance, the work of Ted Sider has suggested that even enduring objects can have temporal parts, and it is more accurate to define perdurantism as being the claim that objects have a temporal part at every instant that they exist. Zimmerman has said that this won't work, as there have been many self-professed perdurantists who believe that time is gunky, and that for every interval of time there is a sub-interval. Consequently, there are no instants, and Sider's definition must be altered to admit of this fact. Currently, there is no universally acknowledged definition of perdurantism. Um, so th this idea that time is gunky, and that for every in interval of time there exists a sub-interval, so that means that there is no final, smallest um, unit of time, um, because every unit is composed of infinitely many more units, and that the, as far down as you go, there will always um, be a certain amount of, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to put it in spatial terms, of extension to a temporal moment. In other words, um, it won't be an instant, it'll be uh, what Whitehead would call a duration, a concrete moment of experience where um, the past is given to you, but the future is also um, present with you, um, and so it's a moment influenced by both past and future. Not in the same way, but um, they're present in the future, so I think the perdurantist theory of time is, is a more concrete way of understanding it, because we see that uh, the real present moment, rather than an abstraction as, as the present moment being an instant, the real present moment is uh, extended. Um, it's part past and part future, and that contrast creates the present. 
So we're constantly in process. We're in a process of becoming. Um, and you know, we can talk as Wikipedia um, calls them the worm theorists. We can talk as the worm theorists do um, about persisting objects being composed of various temporal parts um, so that we are actually persisting four-dimensional worms that stretch across space-time. But, um, see this is again kind of falsely spatializing time, which I talked about in my last video. Um, and as I also said, it's difficult to talk about this because our language is inherently um, based on this subject predicate uh, or you know substance quality uh, logic and so everything becomes uh, a thing with, with a spatial boundary that has certain qualities attached to it and time cannot be contained by that method of description um, so it, it's it's interesting to conceive of temporal objects as being worms stretched across space-time um, but actually you know my body for instance um, its organizational state, the, the quality that makes it living, isn't stretched across space-time, it's present uh, in me, in my body, um, in this self-organizing, self-producing system. Time is kind of um, the intensity of my experience. Um, again, still related to space. Uh, just as matter is related to space, and you know, um, mass and energy are equivalent, right? Einstein also showed us that. So, and energy is somehow, um, or gravity is somehow a form of energy, right? Um, gravity being the curvature of space time. So, somehow, all these things are related in this single process um, and we tend to assume that space dominates this process and that everything is essentially a function of space but that may just be the bias of, of, of you know the fact that our organism preferences its its vision as its dominant sense and so we we think the world is as we see it uh, when really there there are more complexities involved um, but anyways, thanks for turning me on to perdurantism. I'm going to have to read up on that because it's very interesting. I'd never heard of it before. So, um, yeah, keep the videos coming, man. Take care.